I'm going to buy you one just so you have to wear it. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we're going to talk, turn to Joshua 8, Joshua chapter 8. We're going to talk about regaining lost ground. And it's interesting, be, while you're turning there, I came across three interesting things in my studies that really is kind of neat to see how the world is proving, we know the Bible's true, but they're affirming that the Bible is true. Archaeologists have discovered the city of Jericho. The first city the Israelites attacked and conquered upon entering the promised land. And its location is accurate regarding it being the first city they would need to conquer after crossing the Jordan. Awesome. That is so, that's a feather in a cap. While examining the region of Mount Ebal, archaeologist Adam Zertal discovered an unusual mound at the top of the location. After years of work on the site, he concluded that it was Joshua's altar described in Joshua 8 that we're going to talk about this morning, verses 30 and 31. One last one is future, Pastor Jason will be covering Joshua 11, but in 11.11 we read that Joshua burned Hazar itself. Archaeological digs at the site of Hazar show that it was indeed burned in approximately 1400 B.C. That to me is exciting to see those kind of discoveries coming about. We already knew that because the Bible said it and we believe it. But when secular archaeologists find things out and discover things, I think it's just a mar marvelous saying this, that God's saying, okay folks, are you going to believe my word or not. I'm going to give you one more chance. I wish I could discover Noah's Ark. That was, I know it's not in Kentucky. It's a replica, but I wish I could find it and be allowed to, you know, excavate that. But we're coming to regaining lost ground. We realized that, that AI had defeated, as Pastor Jason said, the Israelites. And comebacks are hard. Comebacks are difficult. But you'll see on the screen Michael Jordan, the NBA comeback in 1995. Of course, I had to go sports route for this. Michael Jordan's decision to come back to the NBA after a 17-month stint playing baseball just has to be here in this comeback, greatest comeback. First, the greatest player ever left the game following his third straight title, leaving the league searching for a face of the game. Second, even in his absence, some of the megastars from back then, Charles Barkley, Carl Malone, and Patrick Ewing, didn't win a title, which could have been a great narrative for the league. Finally, when he did lace up his kicks again, he instantly proved to be the player he was before, giving him memorable moments in the second half of his first season before running off another three-peat in his first full season back. Basically, the league needed Jordan. Another one is Indianapolis Colts, the 21-point deficit in 2003. While coming all the way back from a 28-7 fourth quarter deficit is spectacular, the fact that it was Peyton Manning doing it against the then reigning Super Bowl champions in the five, final five minutes of a Monday night game makes this much more dramatic. Manning seemed to be looking for his favorite target, Marvin Harrison, to complete the comeback. As Harrison finished with 11 catches and 176 yards and two touchdowns, which was just one of the many great moments they had together. Then our own Philadelphia Flyers, yay, the NHL Coaster Conference semifinals in 2010. This series, wow, seemed to be featured at all. First, the Philadelphia Flyers found themselves down 3-0 in the best of seven. Eastern Conference semifinals series before they could seemingly blink. Then, when they finally did get to the deciding Game 7 against the Boston Bruins, Philly seemed overwhelmed, giving up the first three period goals. Scratching and clawing their way back, the Flyers scored the next four goals of the game, and much like the series itself, won by the score 4-3, to three, becoming just the third team in NHL history to overcome a three-game deficit. Now, not to get too sports technical, but the 2015-16 Golden State Warriors were very, very good, period. They had won the NBA Finals the previous season and looked like they were going to win another one. But then, 2016 NBA Final was a rematch between the Warriors and the Cleveland Cavaliers. And guess who was there? LeBron James. He'd come home to his local club, specifically to get them a title. Fans had been waiting a long time, and not just fans of basketball. No Cleveland-based pro team had won a championship of any kind since 1964. So the Cavaliers had never won the NBA Finals, period. Now they had two chances in a row, and it looked like they were going to blow them both. Over the years, Cleveland teams had such famous losses, they got names like the dive, the drive, the fumble, and the Michael Jordan's the shot. All had crushed their dreams. They lost its 15 NBA Finals, 4-2. And now they were down 3-1 to to the Warriors in Game 5. 
as Fox 8 Cleveland pointed out, no teams in final history had ever overcome that deficit. Never. But the Cavaliers mounted a comeback to win Game 5 and Game 6 in convincing fashion. At the end of the third quarter in Game 7, the Warriors were barely ahead. A nail-biting fourth quarter saw LeBron James enter his wrist. They put in Mitchell Palmer, but in the end, the Cavaliers won 93-89. to Oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's Lancaster Bible College you're going to. Okay, sorry, Mitchell. Okay. Putting them in the record books, it considered one of the most exciting finals in history, and for Cleveland especially, it was a night to remember. So, as we see about those sports comebacks, making up lost ground is always, always difficult. Always. For the football team that falls behind, okay, to the student who procrastinates and doesn't study, you know, for too long, they uh-oh. Or the couple who spends all their money and spends, overspends and gets in trouble, catching up is hard to do. This was true as we look at the Israelites. This was true in their life as well as Christians today. However, consider the old adage, it's going to be on the screen, there are three men who deserve no pity, the unsecured creditor, the henpecked husband, and the man who will not try again. We're going to focus on that last one, the man who will not try again, because folks, we need to try, we need to try over and over, because guess what? We're imperfect people living in an imperfect world, and we're going to fail. And most admirable quality in the lives of God's children is their trying again and again and again. We seek to live for God and depend on His power and strength, don't we? That's what we want. But we do fail. We fail. And when we fail, it's what? Time to get up again. Time to get up again. So Joshua here teaches us principles for regaining lost ground. Let's read just the first couple of verses of chapter 8. Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear or be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to Ai and its king, just as you did to Jericho and its king. You shall take only its spoil and its cattle, its plunder for yourselves. Set an ambush for the city behind it. Then he goes on about that ambush. So Joshua here is going to teach us about principles for regaining lost ground. Think about, though, where Joshua is at. Israel had sinned, as Pastor Jason said in, in chapter 7, verse 1. The sin of Achan, it was, it was imputed to the nation, so they were defeated by Ai. In, in chapter 7, verse 8, O oh Lord, this is Joshua, what can I say since Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? So Joshua... Think, let's put ourselves in Joshua's position, okay, emotionally, if we can. Put yourself in his position emotionally. Think about it. Joshua now goes back, and he starts thinking of what God said in chapter 1. Let's look at that. Joshua 1, 5. If you want to go there, you can. I think it will be on the screen. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So he's thinking of these verses in chapter 1, verse 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. So emotionally, he's thinking of these sayings, saying, but we were defeated at Ai. What's going on? I know it was sin, but I'm, I'm a little fearful. I'm a little discouraged. And in Joshua 1, 8, he says, keep this book of the law always on your lips meditate on it day and night be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful now I'm going to pause there for a moment because as I was studying this that word meditate kind of just came out and, and slapped me in the face it says meditate on it day and night and I thought we call it here a quiet time prayer time you know that's kind of the terminology we use but here meditate I want us to stop just for a moment and do a, a sidebar okay I'm not a lawyer I mean a liar I mean a lawyer so we'll do that so I want to talk about meditation on God's Word think about it this is a very interesting fact according to the emerging field of neurotheology I had to look that up quiet meditation quite literally changes our brains this is interesting. When we turn off the constant distractions, which is the cell phone, even in church, I heard a beep, somebody got beeped here, you know, cell phones, it's hard to turn them off, isn't it? 
got to have your quiet time. It's right by me just in case, you know. And, and we were talking about this one day, and, and Pastor Frank and I can relate because we're the same age. But when we were little, we'd go out and say, bye, Mom, see you at dinner time. Off we go. She couldn't find us. She couldn't contact us or anything like that. And we'd show up at dinner time. And, and if there was an emergency, some neighbor would come and get us, say, hey, there's an emergency or something. But now we got the phone with us all the time, and we can't turn it off. When you have your quiet time, just a little thing, not to scold you, turn it off. Put it on airplane mode, something, just so you're uninterrupted. So when we turn off the constant distractions and sit quietly before God, focusing intently on His Word and really meditating on it, a few things happen. Here's what happens. Your brain will be psychologically altered. Scientists have found that the brains of people who spend untold hours in prayer and meditation are different. Your imagination will be rewired. Inappropriate thoughts can be combated with positive thoughts. The kind of brain waves present during relaxation increase and, and anxiety and depression decreases. Several studies have demonstrated that subjects who meditated for a short time showed increased alpha waves and decreased anxiety and depression. Here you go, your brain, you want to stay young? Your brain will stay, stays younger, longer if you meditate on God's Word and prayer. A study from UCLA found that long-term meditators have better preserved brains than non-meditators as they aged. That's interesting. You'll have fewer wandering thoughts. One of the most interesting studies in the last few years carried out at Yale University found that mindfulness meditation decreases activity in the default mode, DMN. The brain network responsible for mind wandering and self-referential thoughts, a.k.a. monkey mind is what they call it. Your perspective will eventually shift. When we take time to listen to what God has to say to us, we will see how much he loves us and wants to help us through every situation in life. He gives us the confidence to live extraordinary lives and the power of his Holy Spirit. So, back to, from meditation, I just want to throw that in as a little sidebar because it was just fascinating to say, wow, when we have our quiet time, when we have time in prayer with the Lord, our brain does change. And it's interesting, God already knew that. That's why I said, meditate on it day and night. God created us. He should know how our brain works. All right? And it's interesting because, you know, Brother Tim's here, and, and I'm thankful for those that can operate and, and take that tumor off of your brain and things like that. He's sitting here recovering, and we're thankful for that. But God created that brain. He knows all about it. And God says, I'm not done with Timmy yet. Timmy's not done. Okay? He, he's going to stay around for a while and, and still share the gospel and share his testimony. And it's amazing. God is in control of that and has a plan for us. So back to Joshua, his emotions. Okay, let's go back to him. In verse 9, have I not commanded you? He's thinking again. Be strong and courageous. Right, God? AI just, just took us and, and defeated us. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So can you put yourself in his position? And in verse 17, of Joshua 1. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, this is the Israelites, so we obey you, Joshua. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. And then Joshua thought about Jericho and Rahab, and, and he said, he said uh, how Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. He thought about that. A future verse, I, I wanted to throw this in because it's so good, but Pastor Jason will cover this. But Joshua 24, 15, this is just a bonus. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites and whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So here's Joshua thinking of all those things. All those things. And, and you may be here thinking of all kinds of things that you're fearful of and you're discouraged about. And this is what's neat because God said to Joshua in verse 1, I have a plan for you. So the first point, follow God's plan. That was what Joshua had to do. Follow God's plan. Don't be afraid. And in Joshua 1.9, he says, don't be afraid. So here in this first verse, he says, do not fear, do not be discouraged. God knew Joshua and the Israelites had fear and were discouraged. Just like Jesus, who is God, in John chapter 14, remember, he was talking to all the disciples, telling what's going to be coming, what's going to happen, uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to go away. And, and they were fearful, they, and God knew that, Jesus Christ knew that, and he said, guys, do not, you know, don't, don't be discouraged. Let not your heart be troubled, guys. 
you know, and believe in God, believe also in me. And he goes on and explains to them that he's going to make a dwelling place for them and come and take them back and all those things. God knows this morning to you, he's saying, do not fear, don't be discouraged. Okay, because he said, I have a plan. I have delivered you. What do you say in verse 1? I have delivered you into the hands of King of Ai, his people, the city, and his land. Let's focus, though, on that word fear for a moment. All right? The Israelites had sinned. As Pastor Jason said last week in chapter 7, they had sinned. And that sin led to fear. The people were hesitant to continue their attempt to capture the promised land. They were becoming like the ones that were wandering in the wilderness until they passed away. They were saying, oh man, I'm afraid. I, I, maybe we should have gone back to Egypt like our forefathers or whatever. And they started grumbling and things. You know, their fear led to their lack of confidence. And God gave them his plan. He said, whoa, Joshua, here's the plan. Which tends on their willingness to what? To live by faith, not by fear. That's hard to do. To live by faith, not by fear. And it's funny because I know I've used this before. Forgive me. I'm old. I can use it again. That's the bottom line. But it's funny because I was just watching Indiana Jones the other day. came on. The Last Crusade. And, and remember the last one where I used this before where Indy had to go and take a leap of faith? Folks, that is so true with us. There's the fear. I don't think I can handle it. I can handle it through God. You take that leap of faith. You can't see the bridge that goes across. But sin can cause, can bring fear and loss of confidence in our lives too. Only in confession can we claim the renewed power of God in our lives. Everyone, I don't care who you are, everyone, regardless of gender, fears something. All right? I was going to bring a big snake up here with me this morning and pull it out, but I said, nah, that might be too much. People might really get scared and maybe have a heart attack. So I didn't do that. All right? Uh, but I have a fake one, I have a fake rat, and a fake uh, uh, mouse and spiders. You know, my daughter can tell you about spiders. So people are fearful of something, okay? And fear is completely normal, though, folks. It really is. It's a powerful human emotion that helps protect us from danger. Fear of flight, you know, that type of thing. People today have fears that are more internal than external dangers. Fear is a physical and emotional response to perceived threat or danger. Perceived threat or danger. It doesn't have to be one, but you can perceive it is. Whether the threat or danger is justified or not, fear is automatic, based on internal beliefs about self, others, and one's environment. Tony and Kathy Giovinazzi, I saw a thing that they went up in a balloon. Okay, it was his bucket list. He said, Tony says, like me, little fear of heights, and he was worried. He said, yeah, the basket came up to about here. So he was a little fearful, but he went on it. Anyhow, he said, I'm going on this. It's on my bucket list. So there's fears, and it's based on internal beliefs about self, others, and one's environment. So I said, let me just look up on the internet fears of men. Now, let me pick on the men first, okay? Not pick on you. So I found a site, All Pro Dad. It's secular, but I think as I looked at that, I looked at some of the men, what they feared in the Bible, and it, it kind of goes along with that. It's a harmony with some of the thing, men that are in the Bible, because they're just like us. You know, the biggest fear of men is failing. Failing. Failing doesn't define you, though. It's just something we all experience on the way toward achieving goals. Why are we so afraid of failing? You ever ask yourself that, men? Are we afraid of living with the shame that comes with it, disappointing others, perhaps ourselves? Are we afraid of what it might reveal about us, namely that we have limitations that we'll never get beyond? Second one is being incompetent. We want to know that we have what it takes. We want to be useful, to feel needed. If we don't have what it takes to accomplish the task again, what does it say about us? We all have certain talents. Find your talents and use them. Pour, them and pour into them in order to help others. Don't be afraid to try, learn, and fail. Everyone risk earns, every risk earns you knowledge about yourself. This next one is so important to us men. Being weak or perceived as weak. I believe for a man being perceived as weak, it's just as bad as being weak. So being weak or perceived as weak. And, and, and because there is nothing worse for a man than being weak. Dr. Rennie Brown says that the shame that comes from being perceived as weak keeps men from being vulnerable. The ability to be vulnerable is necessary for growth. Someone who is honest about their emotions and is willing to be vulnerable is the very definition of strength. Two more, being irrelevant. We all want our lives to mean something when all is said and done. If you're struggling with this one, I suggest two things. First, find out what you do best and then use it to help others. 
it's always a good thing to do that. Second, people are in need of love and care. And if you provide that to even one person, you will never be irrelevant. The last one, looking foolish. The more you step out and risk, the more you're going to misfire. But you also have more success. It's okay to be wrong and fall short. You won't lose credibility just because you are and have been wrong. You know, one of the things about men is, is we, we fall short. We don't want to fall short. Well, who has fallen short of the glory of God? All humankind. So when we do that, why are we then, are we fearful to accept Christ because we can't admit that we've fallen short because it makes us look foolish? So that's something, men. Now the women. Okay, here's some fears of the women. The fear of not being liked. This fear stems from how we're socialized because girls develop a desire to be liked more than to win. The fear of sacrificing family time for work, and, and that's our culture today, are, you, my, are my career and children in conflict with one another. Fear of a relationship ending. Women long for commitment because commitment leads to emotional fulfillment. Women want deep bonds and yearn for forever. Fear of losing one's beauty and attraction. Guess what? Billions are spent on that. Fear of something happening to one's children. Fear of rejection. Fear of death or dying. So I just wanted to cover some of those fears. And as you read scripture and you read about these men like Joshua and the Israelites, you can see, do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged. God knows that we as humans are fearful and get discouraged. We do. And he knows that. So we're going to see what we can do about that. Discouragement. Notice he says that as, as well. Discouragement. I, I, in my quiet time from A.W. Tozer, uh, I, I put this down. He said, when we have faithfully put away sin, that accursed thing, which separates between us and God, then and not till then, we may expect to hear from God to our comfort. And God's directing us how to go on in our Christian work and warfare is a good evidence of his being reconciled to us. Can you only imagine, we can only imagine the disheartening effect of the failure of Ai, of the Israelites. These people who lived in victory of Jericho now dwelled in the defeat of Ai. And, and they were wondering, however, God reminded them in verse 1, God reminded Joshua to remind them, I have a plan. And, and how God reminded his people that his plan would bring the victory. He instructed them to take the entire army to Ai. Everyone was involved. He said in verse 3, so Joshua rose with all the people of war to go up to Ai. And Joshua chose 30 men, valiant warriors, and sent them out at night. What a military thing here that he did that God gave into Joshua's mind. Everyone was involved. No one was left out. They set the ambush. He says they're going to set an ambush on the west side uh, and, and fake a retreat so that the people of Ai would be convinced that once again they were running scared. And isn't it like just like God though to take us back to the place where we last did business with him in order to restore our confidence? Isn't that interesting? Because when you are in sin you've got to go back to where you first started that and resolve that and, re and repent of that and get back and to restore confidence in God. He takes us right back that. And indeed, as we read the story, the men of Ai fell for the ruse, didn't they? As they pursued the fleeing army of Israel, once hidden Israeli soldiers entered and torched the whole city and emptied the city of Ai. It was destroyed completely and the men of Ai were defeated. And just like Pastor Jason said, what he said, God said, you can have the plunder now from Ai. And Achan, if he waited, he'd have more than he ever had when he stole it from Jericho and disobeyed God. But here he said, you can have all the plunder you want, just take it, whatever you want. We must remember that no matter our defeats, no matter our defeats in our life, we can experience victory only as we depend on the plan of God in His Word and in our lives, folks. The second thing, rejoice in God's provision. This is through verses 30 through 35 of Joshua 8. And it talks about many things there. We're going to kind of, because of time, streamline it. But rejoice in God's provision. So here, the Israelites took the 30-mile trek, okay, to, she to Shechem in the beautiful valley of Palestine. The valley was about two miles wide. On either side of it stood two mountain ranges, the rugged rocky Mount Ebal and the wooded uh, Mount Gerizim. The time came to stop at Ebal and worship. And they did it according to what God commanded Moses to do, and they built an altar. So as I was looking at that, I said, wow, God's provision. So I went to 2020, what has God provided for us in our life? So I came across some things, and I'm going to read them fast, 
And uh, so bear with me, but this is just a few things that God has given us, those that know him as their Savior. Ready? Big breath. Abundant life, a crown of life, a heavenly home, a new name, answers to prayer, assurance, cleaning, clothing, comfort, companionship, deliverance, divine sonship, everlasting life, fellowship of Jesus, fruitfulness, gift of the Spirit, glory after death, God's protecting care, growth, guidance, hope, inheritance, joy, knowledgeable, peace, knowledge, peace, power, service, renewal, rest, restoration, resurrection, rich reward, spiritual fullness, spiritual healing, spiritual treasure, strength, temporal blessings, understanding, victory, wisdom, air, armor of God. Amen. And there's more. There's more. There is more. I, I was going to try to do that in one breath, but I just couldn't do it. But all those things are provided to us, folks, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. What more do you want? Uh, well, I just want to please my flesh. I want what I want. I don't want God to be in, in the way. Well, he has provided so much stuff for us that if you just focus on those things, that I brought, and there's more, you would say, wow, I am truly blessed. I am truly blessed. So God's provision for us. Third, Joshua said he remembered to give thanks. Look at verse 30 and 31. Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, and Mount Ebal. Remember the archaeologists found that. Just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded in Deuteronomy, the son of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no man has wielded an iron tool, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. Joshua led the people of God in worship. They built an altar according to this, uh, the Deuteronomy. And it was a sign of their thankfulness to God for his victory, not theirs, his victory. It's even, even, it, it, folks, it's easy, even tempting to start celebrating after a victory, not to forget who is ultimately responsible. wonder how many times at Thanksgiving dinners at the table were there uh, that, um, that everyone is recognized except the one who really deserves our thanks. I wonder how many times that happens. I came across Matthew Henry's journal. He was a great theologian. This is what he wrote about worshiping and being thankful. I was accosted by thieves and robbed of my purse. Let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, although they took my all, it was not much. And fourthly, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. What a unique way for this theologian to look at being thankful when he was robbed and turn it and be thankful for it. It's amazing. And, and, and Paul wrote, Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, what did he write? And everything give thanks for this is, the, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I thought about that as I was thinking of thankfulness and how Joshua was leading them and thanking God for their victory. How can we be thank? How can we thank God for terrible things that happen? It's like ask accidents, deaths, and sin. Well, we don't. This is not what Scripture teaches. What God means is to thank Him for His presence and power as we walk through such trials. I think we get that confused sometimes. In Christ Jesus, there is victory and triumph over all, no matter how terrible. Therefore, in everything, not for everything. In everything, not for everything, as we walk through all, thank God in Christ Jesus for the victory he has given us through Christ. We don't have time to develop it, but that verse is, what is the will of God? The will of God in Christ Jesus. And in that chapter, it says, we rejoice always, we pray without ceasing, and we give thanks in everything. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. That's the will of God in Christ Jesus. And last, renew your commitment. In verses 32 through 35, Joshua remembered during the celebration and the worshiping and sacrifices to give attention to God's word. God's word. What did he say in verse 32? Look what he did. He said, he wrote there on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written in the presence of the sons of Israel. And he gathered everybody around and read it to them. He read it to them. The behavior of Joshua and Israel was a symbol of their renewed commitment to God. Now, some will read this chapter and see the regained ground that they that which was overtaken at Ai, but the real regain the real regained ground though was the renewed commitment of God's people to Him. That was the regained ground with God's people to Him. Just like water, our tendency is to flow only down here, downhill spiritually. That's what happens when we go to the flesh. 
We go down spiritually. We need to be reminded constantly in times of challenge, folks, and in times of victory that our real strength and our real source is God. Commitment to Him in worship and His Word restores ground previously lost because of sin. So my question to you is this morning, why do we search for significance in the things of the world? Think about how powerful the flesh is. Now, let me take you on a future trip. It's the Millennial Kingdom, the thousand-year Millennial Kingdom. People are being born, people are, are, are growing up and maturing, and after a thousand, and, and Christ is ruling and reigning, everything, no food problems, no, no COVID problems, everything's great, kind of like a utopia, and he rules with an iron fist, and all those things are taking place, everybody, and it's peace. No wars or anything like that. At the end of thousand years, Satan's loose. The scripture says a lot of people follow him, thinking they still can defeat God. Think of the depravity of man to be in that situation, and when Satan's loose, he can still convince people, and here we are as Christians, and we don't think we can be influenced by, by the evil one. We think we're strong enough on our own that we can withstand the devil and sin, and he comes in, he messes our life up, and he pulls us away just like water going downhill. Folks, we've got to be careful. Why do we search for things, significant things in the world? Only through a relationship with Jesus can we be at peace. There's a verse, Psalm 139, 23 through 24. I don't know if it's, yeah, it's going to be on the screen. This is a tough verse to pray. Search me, O God. I challenge you, do this this week. Search me, O God, and know my heart. He already knows your heart, but you're committing that to him. Search me and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Who doesn't have anxious thoughts in our days that we're living in? Point out anything in me that offends you. Not you, not each other, but offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. If you do that, if you're sincere about that, ask for God's guidance in the following areas. And here's, here's the challenge to you. To help me be honest with myself. Who is really honest with their self? Well, I am. There's times I haven't been honest with myself. I've been in the flesh. I've been sinning. And I haven't been honest. I've tried to camouflage it. Take it, blame my wife for it, all those things, but I've been in sin. You've got to be honest with yourself. To help me think the way God thinks, that's difficult. How does God think about things? Not how our culture or each other, how does, what does God think about things? Tell me think the way God thinks. Tell me deal with my feelings in a godly way, not a fleshly way. To know and apply God's truth to my life. Oh, who wants to do that? I want to make my own truth. I want to do what's right in my eyes. I want to make up truth. I want to say that truth is not found in the Word of God. Or if it is, it doesn't mean it's me to me. To know and apply God's truth in my life. To find a person, and this is the difficult, to find a person who will keep me accountable. And who will pray with me and for me. Accountability. Because you know why? Because the more we understand God's Word and live by it, the more our feelings will reflect His character and love. And why the accountability? Because we need, to help, we need help to see ourselves objectively. We need help to see ourselves objectively. That's why we need somebody to come alongside us. We have the Holy Spirit. He does convict us. If there's not conviction there, you better test yourself, like Paul said in Corinthians, to see if you have the faith. Because if there's no conviction, you may not be a child of God. You may be a doer of the Word, but not a possessor of the Word. Okay? So you've got to be careful. The Lord wants us to be honest with Him and ourselves. And people don't want to be honest with themselves or with God. God has declared you holy. This is the beautiful part about being saved. God has declared you holy and blameless, adopted you, redeemed you, and forgiven you. Act like it. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Joshua 8. Lord, I am so thankful that we can read the, the Word of God and that we can pull out things, Father, that apply to our lives even in 2020. Lord, some of the things that I've shared convicted me to my heart especially about being honest about myself. God, I need to improve how I live for you. Lord, I have fallen short of my life and living for you. God, why do we think that our sin doesn't affect anybody? Oh, Father, I, I think about the, the people that I've dealt with. And Lord, how sin has affected uh, a spouse, has affected family, immediate family, siblings, children. Oh, Father, just like here we saw how Achan's sin affected all the Israelites. 
And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to really be honest because, Lord, time is short. I really believe that we are in the last days. Perilous times are here. Lord, it's interesting as you see how the world is being conditioned for a cashless society because we know during the tribulation that you cannot buy or sell without the mark of the beast. And Lord, we have to get rid of cash. We have to be able to deal with just no money. We see how people are doing what's right in their own eyes. We have seen just the, the morals of the United States are pitiful, are just in the pit of hell. Even in Christian circles. Christian churches. We see apostasy going through churches and declaring there's more way, there's more, more than one way to heaven, and that's not through Christ. And Lord, we stand and say, no, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but through me. Oh, Father, I pray if there's one here this morning that has been playing games with you and isn't really saved, that they would be honest with you because, Lord, we're not promised tomorrow. Lord, and I'm not here to f scare anybody or put fear in them. Lord, but we know that we could die tomorrow. We're not promised. We could die today. Lord, so I, I remember reading how a, a man was sitting in church and, and he, he died right in the pew. Lord, I pray that we'd be honest with you because we don't get a second chance. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. So I pray if there's one here, they'd seek out Pastor Jason, Pastor Frank, or I, and we could let them see in the Word of God without a shadow of doubt that if they trust in Jesus alone, they'll go to heaven. And then be able to have all the things provided to them, God's provision, to live a joyful life. God, you want us to have joy in our life. But when we sin and we rebel against your word, we don't have it. So, Father, I pray for anyone that is even in a position that needs to confess and repent, that they would do that as well. Thank you for this morning. We pray for the safety of each one of us as we travel to our homes, Lord. I, I pray that air conditioners wouldn't break down, that, Lord, fans would not break down, that the car air conditioners would work, that, Lord, thank you for these things. We thank you because what, it would be really hot without them. So we thank you for just making our, our brains able to create such a thing. We thank you for the medical care that we can receive. But where that stops, we know you're the great physician. So heal those that need to be touched by you and healed. And, Lord, uh, we know you have done that already in the past. We pray, Father, as we now transition into our meeting about uh, what, where we're headed, Father, as a church and what we're going to be doing, Father, uh, to reach the community for Christ. Because, Lord, a as I heard yesterday, a man said that it's okay if lay people tell about Jesus. Lord, uh, Pastor Jason, Pastor Franks, and my job here, our ministry is to equip the saints to do the work in the ministry. So, Lord, that's what we're trying to do, give opportunity to the, the saints here, the forever family of Jesus Christ, to go out and reach the community for Jesus Christ because time is short. And I believe people are open to Christ right now more than ever because of just the fear that they're in, because death is all around us. So, Lord, thank you again. Thank you for just the, the blessings of each day. Continue to pray for Timmy and his healing, Father, and for Patty. And just, uh, Father, be with them as well and many others who are still healing from things. Karen, as Pastor Frank, pray for her and, Lord, others that to struggle on a daily basis. Some that can't be here because of their illnesses, their immune system is a little bit lower than normal. So just thank you for all the people that are watching by Facebook. Folks, we love you and we miss you. And we do pray for you. Now, Father, guide us and direct us as we go about serving you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, folks, if you're here visiting and you're welcome to leave right now, we're going to transition to this little meeting and talk about our vision for 2020, regular tenders you can do. So why don't everybody just stand up so it's not awkward. Everybody look